Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we started our discussion of crystals by looking at the different lattice types and some examples of each. Today I want to tell you a bit about one of the techniques we can use to study molecules and determine their structure, X-ray crystallography. It turns out that the structure of a molecule can be determined by growing a crystal of it, then using X-rays to determine the positions of the atoms in the crystal. This is especially useful for large molecules like proteins. X-ray crystallography has been used to precisely determine the structure of literally tens of thousands of different proteins. Here's how it works. Suppose we have a crystal. Since crystals consist of a unit cell repeated millions of times, the atoms in a crystal appear in a regular repeating pattern. Suppose we imagine the positions of the atoms in a crystal like this. This example is very simple looking, but in general the discussion that follows is still true for any crystal, no matter how complicated the positions of the atoms in the unit cell. Now, suppose we shine X-ray light onto the crystal's surface at some angle theta. If the photon happens to strike one of the atoms, it may be reflected. As you might recall from your physics course, the angle at which the photon is reflected will be the same as the angle of incidence, which is theta. However, only a small number of photons will strike an atom on the surface. The rest will travel between the surface atoms and will instead be reflected off atoms in a deeper layer of the crystal. However, they'll still be reflected from those deeper layers at an angle of theta. Let's look at a photon reflected from the surface layer and a second photon reflected from the second layer of atoms. Suppose the second layer of atoms is a distance d below the surface. Let's draw a line that stretches from the top vertex and is normal to the second x-ray. As you can see, the second x-ray must travel a little further than the first x-ray before it hits an atom. The extra distance is given by this line segment. And how long is that? Well, geometry tells us that this angle is equal to theta. That means that this line segment has a length of d sine theta. So the second x-ray must travel further an additional distance d sine theta before it hits an atom. That means during its passage through the crystal, the second photon travels a total additional distance of 2 d sine theta. The two photons are close enough together to interfere with one another. What will happen as a result? Well, if the photons are slightly out of phase, they'll destructively interfere, and the intensity of light that emerges from this crystal will be lower. The two x-rays emerging from a crystal can only constructively interfere if they're precisely in phase, and that can only happen if the extra distance traveled by the second photon is a multiple of the photon's wavelength. That gives us this equation, where n is equal to some positive integer, and theta is in radians. If we rearrange slightly, we get this. Let's think about what this equation is telling us. Suppose we're using x-rays with a wavelength lambda, and we shine it on a crystal. If we hold the x-ray source stationary, we can rotate the crystal around so that the x-rays sweep through a range of angles as they hit the crystal. As we do that, we'll see that we only get constructive interference when the equation above is true. So the x-ray signal being reflected from the crystal appears only when the fraction on the right is equal to d over 1, d over 2, d over 3, etc. For example, suppose we hit the crystal with x-rays having a wavelength of 0.1542 nanometers, which is a commonly used x-ray wavelength. We perform a crystallography experiment by rotating the crystal, and we find out that we get bright spots, which means constructive interference, when the x-ray hits the crystal at these angles. Each of these must correspond to a constructive interference resulting from a different fraction on the left side of the equation. The first point results from the situation where n equals 1, the next is where n equals 2, and so on. 
What can we do with this information? The main thing we can do is determine d, the separation between the atoms. Let's solve the equation for d by plugging in the data where n is 1 and we have theta equals 0 0.21893. That gives us a value for d of 0 0.355 nanometers. That's also what we get if we use the angles for the other locations of constructive interference. So now we know the distance between the atoms in the first and second layers. The example we just did was for the simplest possible kind of crystal, in which the atoms in each layer are directly above the atoms in the next layer. That's hardly ever the case in a real crystal, and the real situation makes the mathematics much more difficult, although the general idea is still the same. Also, notice that in the example we just did, we imagine the angle between the x-rays and the crystal in the plane of the computer screen. In reality, we must scan the crystal so that the x-rays can come from any conceivable direction, including from out of the plane of the screen in this image. That way, we can get information about all three dimensions. In that case, we need to use a computer to interpret the results, which are much too complicated for us to do with a simple pen and paper. The resulting data is known as a crystallograph. Here's what the result of such a scan looks like for a sodium chloride crystal. Note that this is a negative image, which means that the dark spots, not the light spots, are the result of constructive interference. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll look in depth at the energy it takes to form a crystal, or to destroy one. Many crystals form extremely thermodynamically stable crystals, so we'll be looking at especially high energies and enthalpies. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.